Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Jay, and I'm the founder and CEO. I'm here with one of my best friend and the smartest guy I have ever met, Nikhil, who is from Archera. Nikhil, would you all like to introduce yourself? My name is Nikhil. I'm the co-founder and CTO at Archera. We're a leader in the cloud cost management space. We have a free platform that lets customers optimize using short-term insured commitments to let them get the savings of a longer-term commit uh, savings plan or reserved instance without any of the lock-in. So, Nikhil, tell me something about that. How did you start the company? What is the story behind it? Yeah, so we started it about five years ago. Um, in the past, my other co-founder, my brother, actually, uh, he worked at AWS on the SageMaker team. And one of the problem areas he solved was that there were a lot of times when training like machine learning workloads or other necessarily short-term workloads, there was often really, they were often really expensive and there was really no instrument to get savings on them, right? If you have a machine learning job, a training job, it's not going to be up for a full year, right? It's only up until your model gets trained. And so there was really a gap there where there was really no way to get savings on that other than just paying that full on-demand rate. So coming together, we decided that there has to be a better way to do this. And by approaching it from like a financial and insurance-based perspective, we were able to come up with a way to be able to get the savings of a reserved instance or savings plan, but instead using shorter term commitments to be a good fit for those sorts of workloads or just any workload where there's uncertainty around commitment on AWS. Yeah, I certainly see that lots of uh, potentially that because, I mean, long ago when I was working in a big enterprise company, I saw that, you know, there are lots of uh, organizations who are using lots of infrastructure from the cloud, but they have not idea that how much time and how much money is being spent. So I truly see there's a great potential and, you know, it is really going to help those organizations to get better on their financial side and so having great visibility that how and where to act. You are here in AWS reInvent 2023 and I saw you guys have put in the booth also. So congratulations for that. Uh, so tell me that uh, how far the AWS reInvent is going on for you guys? Yeah, it's been good. It's been busy getting a lot of steps and walking between all the hotels here in Vegas. Uh, losing my voice or starting to lose my <laughs> voice from all the p pitches we've been giving. But yeah, it's been really fun. Cool, cool. Yeah, I saw the LinkedIn post also and I saw your team. So, so that's pretty great. Cool. So uh, you guys have been using Labra for quite some time, right? So I would like to understand some of the things, not really Labra, but let's talk a little ele elevated and talk about like, what do you think, what is the current trend in the cloud commerce you are observing? Yeah, so um, this is really just a question of how am I paying for the software that I'm using, right? Um, in the past, you might see a lot of folks charging customers through ways like Stripe or even direct invoicing, ways that end up being a little bit higher friction in the sense that I need to get a credit card on file. I need to deal with a separate billing process outside the sort of regular way that I'm paying for my cloud. And that ends up being like a really so a high friction source for customers. Um, increasingly, especially over the last year or so, we've seen an increasing shift towards moving some of that spend off those traditional billing channels onto sources like the AWS marketplace, where an increasing number of software vendors are actually moving a lot of their spend on services such as Snowflake or Datadog or Archera in our case. Um, so that's just been a growing trend that we've been seeing um, increasingly so. And there are a lot of reasons for that, both from sort of a partnerships perspective and also just in terms of what's lower friction for the end customer, which is really the main driving force here. Do you see there are lots of marketplaces? I mean, it's not lots of, there are three primary marketplaces. What do you find that is a unique in the AWS marketplace? Yeah, so I would say that AWS probably has the most mature marketplace in terms of both just the product itself, you know, how listings work and the general user experience for an end user actually going through, figuring out the terms of the software they're using and actually procuring that kind of software, but also just from a sales perspective as well. So AWS has a fantastic sales system with their AWS reps. And a lot of these reps have really trained their customers on how to go about procuring software on the AWS marketplace. That's really been a big internal push we've seen in AWS, right? And just because of that, AWS probably has had the biggest tailwind in terms of customers understanding how to use the marketplace. And more importantly, really just trusting it both as a place to find software and as a billing mechanism with which to pay for that software. Um, so really, AWS is ahead of the curve there. Um, the other clouds are, of course, as usual, looking at AWS and trying to play catch up in that realm. But currently, AWS is far and away the market leader. And I think that's reflected pretty much in all the trends and all the statistics about it. Right. I truly agree. And one thing is that which I really like about AWS is that the, the speed with which they are innovating. And uh, we at Labra, 
we are always on the forefront working with them and catching up with them. That's a good thing, actually, because uh, helping the customers, everyone, everyone is winning the game because of these innovations. So that is something unique, and I hope that they will continue doing that. Uh, so once you started using Labra, uh, you may have some experience now with Labra. How do you see that this is actually going to play a role in a bigger picture for cloud commerce for everybody in the industry? Yeah. So um, there are a couple of different ways. Um, in many ways, I kind of view Labra almost similarly from a sort of CTO uh, programmer perspective, the way I yeah. view Stripe, right? Where right. it's a place where I'm managing a lot of my payments infrastructure. And those payments are coming from a diverse array of sources, right? It's coming from AWS Marketplace. It's going to be coming from Azure Marketplace, other cloud marketplaces like GCP as well. Um, and this is something where each of those systems obviously are not going to integrate with each other. So there's a need for a centralized platform, just like Stripe lets me collect invoice data and credit card payments in the same sort of place. That's really the role that Labra fills in my organization. And there are a lot of parallels actually between like Labra and Stripe in that sense. Um, I need to make sure that all my systems are running and are well supported because this is a really important part of my business. I need to make sure I have great developer documentation and great developer support when I'm actually going about implementing this because this is not an area where you yeah. want to make a mistake or take any risks. And this is also an area where you need fantastic customer support because most of the, if any issues arise, that's a pressing issue, right? It's someone's money that's being messed with. So ultimately, um, that's really the way I see Labra. It's it's this place where I can get, where I can handle my payments across this diverse array of marketplace uh, offerings from these different cloud vendors. Right. And I can make sure I can handle them in a simple interface that's easy to work with, well-supported, and that I can honestly trust. True, true, true. Uh, one thing I would definitely want to add here in terms of the innovation that what we are bringing in the industry. Right now, if you look at the industry as a whole, everyone is focusing on solving the current challenges. But our approach has always been that Okay, let's solve the current challenges, but always keep the eye open for the longer term. So what I mean to say is that right now, if you see that in the cloud commerce space, marketplace, wholesale, people are just trying to get the data, connect the data with each other. So at the moment, I see as industry as a whole, we are just trying to connect the data with each other. But the next version of the evolution or the innovation going to happen where it's not only data, how can you gather the insight from the data? How can you make your business process efficient? How can you make the cloud commerce efficient? Because cloud commerce has a two sides. One is the sellers, one is the buyer, right? You cannot complete the journey just the one side. You have to think from the both the side and enhance it both the end, right? So I think you guys would also be benefiting for that one because you have seller side, you are on the buyer side. You also need the uh, to increase your revenue by bringing the channel partner, bringing the distributors, bringing the resellers, MSPs, right? So unless you connect all of them uh, and get the insight, I don't think that we would be able to get the as much benefit as we are taking today. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think, you like you're saying, that there's the kind of two primary sides, which is the buyer and the seller. And typically in any solution, sort of the buyer's experience is the most important, making sure they have a smooth customer experience. But there are other stakeholders involved, especially in, you know, software as a service sales, B2B software as a service sales. Um, and that's a trend that we've only seen increase, right? So you said it yourself, folks like resellers, distributors, MSPs, all of these are folks who are now increasingly involved in these sorts of sales. So it's no longer just a two-sided buyer-seller yep. dynamic that's going on. There are other folks who are involved in the sale, who have a stake in the sale, um, and ultimately need to be involved in that sales process. So you said it yourself, really where this is going is not just collecting the dots on the data, but making sure that all the different stakeholders are also sort of in the loop in the way that they need to be, right? If I'm working with a reseller, I need to make sure that they have the data and the insights they have that in terms of, you know, what's being transacted over the cloud marketplace, how their, how their customer, their end customers are actually doing with the service and pretty much all the metrics around that in terms of revenue in terms of customer retention so that they're able to make their decisions well. And having a centralized place where those insights can be generated is going to be really important for not just my business, but a whole host of SaaS businesses and B2B SaaS businesses in right, the future. Right. Uh, let's change the topic a little bit here. Like you are CTO and I'm the CTO. So let's talk about some of the product development and engineering side as well. Uh, I have met some of your engineers and I'm, they're really a smart engineer. So mm -hmm. 
kudos to you for building such a great team. Yeah. I would definitely like to hear from you that how you were able to build such a great and a smart team. What was the, the secret sauce behind it? Yeah, I think the main thing and the thing that makes like the engineers I work with every day fantastic is just a sense of responsibility and ownership. Like we really do have a culture where folks are happy to come into work every day and where everyone is able to take on a big role in making sure that our products are successful and our customers are successful. There's really, there in terms of sort of division of responsibility, that obviously exists, but there really is this holistic vision that everyone's aligned with. Um, especially when it comes to making sure that customers are getting their needs met and ultimately everyone's having good experience. And I think just having that culture of sort of ownership throughout the engineering org is really, really important. That's very important. And also giving the sense of comfort that even if you're failing, you're taking the risk. There's no one actually blaming you. Basically, it's all about the learning, right? I mean, if you don't take the risk, you are not actually unlocking the potential what could be there. Exactly. Right? And the other thing is that giving the freedom to them is another important part. So I feel like that that's what has been your uh, most important point for growing the team. And I think like working on any engineering product, there are always going to be stumbles. And I yes. think just having that idea, that sort of extreme ownership principles of when something goes wrong, it's not a question of throwing blame around. It's really a question of figuring out systematically what can we do to make sure that this is a more robust process in the future and making sure that that sort of culture is built into an engineering org is incredibly important. So uh, do you have the distributed team or everybody's co-located? Uh, so we have a distributed team. So okay. we have folks in Seattle, in Austin. We have folks sitting in Vancouver and throughout Canada. So we're really all over the place. Uh, we're, we're a fully remote team. Um, this actually kind of goes back to the company history. We actually started um, right before COVID happened. So pretty much everyone was forced to be remote during the early years of the company. Uh, and that's the way that we learned to operate. And that's kind of the way we've stayed because that's the way we hired and that's the way we've found an uh, efficient way to kind of work together in that sort of remote first way. What actually keeps you awake in the night? Um, I think the main thing is really just the kind of opportunities that are out there, right? So uh, you mentioned this earlier in terms of working with uh, distributors, working with resellers, working with MSPs. Um, that's uh, just a massive channel. You could spend a lifetime working, uh, just tapping those channels, working with those sorts of folks. And I think really just making sure that we're able to use those channels to best kind of get our product out there and into the hands of folks who are able to get value out of it that's really what makes me want to work and keeps me up at night. So I hope Labra is helping you and making sure that you have good sleep in the night. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I don't think I've ever had better like customer support from a software product before. Uh, I drew the parallels to Stripe before because I think Stripe is also a company that has fantastic customer support. And I think Labra is just like Stripe in that way where as a developer, I can trust the documentation. I can trust the code. And if I ever have any questions, it's really easy for me to get a prompt response and make sure that I can keep my worries at ease and be confident in the solution. All right. So, and uh, what do you suggest us how we should be improving our product in order to make your life easier? Yeah, I, I, I really think um, the main way is basically what you touched on in terms of future direction, which is making it so it's easier for us to work with these other stakeholders and sort of aggregate data in a way that we can provide visibility to the other folks involved in these in, like increasingly complicated sales. I, and I think that that's very much the direction that, that you seem to be heading. So it's definitely well aligned there. Okay. I know that you have to go to AWS reInvent back again. So I would not be holding you a lot here. But before you go, I would like to know that what are the advice or the suggestions you may have for the upcoming CTOs? Yeah, I, I think the main thing is to start off with trying to get on your marketplace journey earlier rather than later. Like I know it's easy to hook up other payment processors and get and get customers kind of over the hump and on those solutions, but it's way better in my opinion to start off on a cloud marketplace, um, making sure that that motion is really strong just because there's a lot more inbuilt trust with customers. And even though there'll be some growing pains as you start to initially move over from those other solutions, I think you'll notice there's a really big tailwind and customers have a lot of trust for those, for cloud marketplaces now in terms of the main way they're actually doing their procurement and paying for these sorts of services. One thing I would also like to add on top of what you just mentioned is that uh, cloud marketplace give an opportunity to product managers to also set the strategy for the A-B testing of their product offering in the market to go quickly to the market, put on the marketplace 
and see that whether it's working out or not. Because the process for putting on the marketplace and the, the friction point is pretty low. So it gives them then an opportunity that, hey, build something, put it in the marketplace, put it there for like a few days, see that how does it uh, getting the atten uh, attention from the customers. Are there any business coming up? What are the things we need to change in the uh, product to make sure that we have more customers? All those, so, so it's kind of testing bed. You know, it's like an A-B testing you can do on the marketplace and then per keep perfecting. So I believe getting onto the marketplace should be the strategy from the product management side as well. It's not, it sh should not be from the, only from the sales, only from the GTM. I believe product management also needs to get involved and from the day one, they should be. Yeah, I think so. And I think that just from a product-led growth perspective, being on the marketplace has a ton of advantages. Um, if you do a bottom-up sale, especially um, like for instance, Archero is a free platform. So it's easy for customers to sign up to the marketplace. And that makes it so it's really easy to actually be able to onboard quickly and immediately start getting value at the platform in a way that it would be a lot more friction laden if we were going through traditional procurement processes. We had to get, you know, a Stripe credit card on uh, on file before even yeah. getting to get use out of the platform. There's a lot of value there just from a product led growth perspective that I think a lot more companies should take advantage of. All right. So uh, as I said that I won't take much time of you, Nikhil. I truly appreciate that you took the uh, few minutes from your business, uh, from your busy time to come to over here and talk to me. And uh, your, I really enjoy talking to you and it was really insightful. So thank you so much for your time. And I hope you have a great rest of your day and good luck for the reInvent. Yeah, likewise. Have a great reInvent. Thank you for having me. Thank you.